This is part two. If you haven't seen the first one, it's linked right here. Okay, let's start. Welcome to the Daily BA. If you're new here, BA is short for Behavior Analysis. This is the first part of a new series that I'll continue to work on called The Archives, where I'll share something from the past related to the field of, you guessed it, Behavior Analysis. If you're not sure what this field's about, I've got a video right here explaining it all. If you aren't aware of what precision teaching is, guess what, you can go up here, a video as well. Those two will give you a little bit of context as to what's being discussed in this video. So today is a recording of a training that occurred in 1992 at a treatment facility called the Judge Rottenberg Center, led by Ogden Lindsley, that's who's speaking, which I've coincidentally also covered in a separate video, so if you need a little bit more context on his life, check it out up here as well. Now these videos were handed to me from a gentleman named Bob Warsham. Thank you so much for going through the approval process and handing these over. You'll notice what I call a few jump cuts where we just jump ahead in time. This is because there's something from the video that was removed for various reasons, either personal information that people don't want to have shared, client specific information was shared, or we're afraid that things will be taken out of context. Now I have two final things before we start. First of all, this is 1996. This is uh, extremely low res. I've done my best to try to preserve it as well as the audio it is the best that I can possibly do. And much more importantly, in the context of 1992 that I'm asking you to continually remember, it's really, really important to remember that this is a time where different language, different words were used to describe different things. You'll see various medical terminology that is no longer used by this field that is in this video. Just please remember the context. All right, with no further ado, the Ogden Lindsley Archives, volume two. Okay, how many got zero? One, two, yeah. and way up. Just one person got two? So we got two. Let's see if that. Let's see if it's, uh... Okay, how many got three? Four or five. Four and five. One, two, three, four. How many got six, seven, and eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many got nine, ten, eleven, and twelve? One, two, three, four, five. How many got 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17? One, two, is that it? Just two? You, you were one? No. No, two. How many got 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24? Anybody get any more than that? So that's our distribution for... the precision, for precision teaching facts first time through. Now, if I, if I have any success in the next hour or so, we should be able to increase that frequency some. And uh, that's really a pretty good frequency. Notice here again, the distribution's pretty, pretty much normal on a multiply scale. People are spread apart pretty much the same and multiply. Most teachers don't realize that. Like if you have 15 or 20 kids or 10 kids in your classroom and the middle kid is doing 10 per minute right and the top kid is doing 20 per minute right, what's the bottom kid doing? The middle's 10, the top's 20, what's the bottom? What? Five is multiply. Most people, most teachers think 10 though. They think they think the distance from the middle kid to the top kid should be the same as from the middle kid to the bottom kid in an ad world. They think 10 plus 10 is 20, 10 minus 10 would be like zero. But if 10 to 20 is times two, 10 divided by two goes down to five. That's why m m most of you think that your better kids are much more better than your middle kids, than your bad kids are worse because you're not used to that multiply. No matter what performance it is, athletics, push-ups, running the mile, doing basic ad facts, doing long division, th that same thing will be true. The, the distance from the middle kid to the top kid will be the same multiple as from the middle kid to the bottom kid. If you have it on a multiply chart, like I have it here, it automatically takes care of it. So I'll just share with you some code some facts we've learned about precision teaching and 
some of them about behavior in general, and some of them are about precision teaching factors all by themselves. We, we've developed some code words for this. And the code word, one code word is music. And this, most teachers in the world and most parents, most people do not believe these things. We believe the exact opposite, which is one reason education is in such a mess. So what do you think M stands for? Multiply. Multiply. And most people think add. Add is wrong. So behavior grows by multiplying, it bounces by multiplying, and it spreads by multiplying. It spreads across people. Say multiple up is down. Daily bounce. If if you, if your children if you have performances on a standard acceleration chart, it will be bouncing up the same multiple distance as it's bouncing down, which would be equal on the chart. On an add chart, it would always bounce up higher than it bounces down. On a multiply chart, it bounces up the same distance as it's down. Most daily bounce is about times two or times three, about the width of a pencil. What's two pencils wide? Times four. So that, that's the whole multiply thing. If one quarter is like times 11 or 12, what's two quarters? Yeah, times 100. 10 times 10. One's pretty close to times 10. 10 times 10 is 100. Goes from one to 100. No matter where it is on the chart, it's multiple. And if a dime is like times five, what's two dimes? Quick, quick, what's two dimes? Yeah. Twenty-five, you got it, that's right. Why don't most people know anything about multiplication? Because they never were taught it. If, if we want to multiply by two, so, so will somebody multiply by, or the whole, whole room multiply by two for me, right? Start with zero. Times two is? Zero. Times two is? Zero. Times two is? So we don't get any agreement. Some people think they can multiply out of zero. Here they are. They got somehow through elementary school, somehow through high school, somehow got on the damn payroll, and they can't multiply. <laughs> Serious about this. Very basic problem. If the world lives by multiplying and you can't do it, you're in a hell of a mess. If cancer grows by multiplying and you can't multiply, you'll check in to have your tumor out much, much, much too late. You'll wait till it gets big. But if you know the little thing went from the size of a of a BB shot to the size of a P in two weeks, where will it be two weeks from now? The size of a lemon. And where will it be two weeks from then? The size of a grapefruit. Cancer multiplies. Cockroaches multiply. Love multiplies. You can't grow it out of nothing. Love, if love's going away, how does it go? It divides goes from 10 to 5, 5 to 2 and a half, 2 to 1, and finally it's all gone. There's always a little trace there. So what does that mean? If you're going to build behavior, you're going to teach somebody to do something, can you start with zero? You've got to start with them doing something and double that. So it means you have to back way back. If they can't hold a ball, will you get any place guiding them with your hands? They got, they got zero ball hold now. So you're going to create a one by putting your hands on them and, and, and teaching them to grab a ball. What will they do? Wait for you to come and pick up their hands. So if you're going to teach them to grab a ball and the ball holding is zero, what do you got to teach them? how to bump a ball or something, how to nudge a ball, how to just go up and shoulder the damn thing. 
So another way, you're trying to teach a kid to catch balls, and you throw the ball and he doesn't catch it. Throw the ball and it bounces off him. You got zero, right? Can you teach him to catch it with a zero? No. One thing you can do is go to a local tennis shop and get maybe a bushel basket of spent tennis balls. Bushel basket, we got maybe 60 balls now. Hold them up across the room and throw the balls at them as fast as you can in a minute, right? I guarantee you one of them will stick. One of them will stick. He'll, he'll catch one out of 60. Now, can you teach him now, right? Keep throwing the balls. Next time, maybe two will stick. After that, he's, he's trying to make them stick. He hasn't got his hands going yet, but he's, he's trying to wing them. He's trying to get them with his arms. Lots of balls, high frequency, high error, 59 wrong, one right. It's ideal learning conditions. That's kind of what precision teaching is all about. Anybody know what U is? Unique. What? Unique. Unique. You should expect each and every learner to have to learn a different way, to need a slightly different program. And we use the chart to custom tailor the program to the kid. So if you've got 15 kids in the class and they're all doing the same thing, you can't be doing precision teaching. You may be charting the progress, but you're not custom tailoring the, the curriculum to each kid. There are people all over the country who say they're doing precision teaching because they've got a funny blue chart and a bunch of flat dots on it, but nobody's learning anything. And the teacher's just charting progress, but there's any progress. Progress is a, is a line up the chart. Progress is not a horizontal line. So what do most people expect? When SRA sends you one math program for all of Providence, what do they think? They're, they're betting that people have common, people have common needs. The Army doesn't even do that. They make all the uniforms the same color, but they're all different sizes. Very f a few prisons have one size, one uniform, and the little guys in a great big orange thing, and the tall guys in, in the shriveled up, looks like he's shrunk. So it's, it's one size, one thing for everybody. So I think you can see traditional education, which is going on right now in Hope High School, is mostly all wrong. All, all think and add, all common procedures. What's S? Anybody got an idea? Specific. Learning is highly specific. If you learn, if you learn to spell sitting down at a table, and then you go to teacher school and you get up at a chalkboard, you will find that you've got spelling errors. And the spelling at the desk is not the same as spelling at the chalkboard. Spelling with a pencil is not the same as spelling with a pen. Spelling with a pencil is not the same as spelling on a keyboard or the computer. So every time you go to a slightly new situation, errors will come in, the frequency will drop, the behavior will fall apart. You can use this specificity to your advantage sometimes. Say you're trying to break a bad habit. When should you break it? When should you try to stop smoking or picking your nose or swearing? Or, or, or being critical of your lover. Should you try it with your current lover or in between lovers? In between. When you start with that new guy, say, I am going to do my damnedest not to talk back to him. And it'll be a lot easier than changing midstream. Sometimes I've, I think the reason so many people in America nowadays have three marriages before they learn to be a decent wife or a decent husband is, it's kind of sad because the first one did all the teaching, but didn't get any of the benefit. It takes like, you know, the average clod guy has to run through two women to learn how to be a decent husband. It's, it's highly specific. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have been away from home long enough. When you go back home, all the old behaviors will come out if you're not careful. <laughs> you know, 
you, you go to your kid bedroom and you're liable to look for a, 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 a picture book and masturbate or something or other. <laughs> really, grown man. But, but that behavior's still there in that old house, that old home, that behavior's still there. That's the behavior specific, and you should, you should, to make it generalized, you have to teach it in new environments. You can't expect to build it in this room and have it work across the hall. You've got to teach it across the hall, too, and follow it around and build it in all the new environments. Universities and crazy people teach you that behavior is generalized, and it isn't. You have to make it be generalized. You have to work very hard by teaching it in lots of different environments. <coughs> What's I? Anybody know? Independent. This really surprised us. If you build corrects, well, what will happen to errors? If, if you accelerate number of minute correct, what will happen to the errors? Mm -hmm. Most people think they go down. No, no, no. That's, that's blind fate. That is totally wrong. They can accelerate. They can maintain. They can decelerate. The only time that they're bound to go down is when you only have 10 problems, and you won't let them do any more than 10, and you don't time them. Then, then you will build a world that fits your belief, which is wrong. But if you have open, open behavior, and not just a limited number, the number right can accelerate, the number wrong can accelerate. They can even have corrects going up very fast and errors going up not so fast and percent correct increasing. Errors are going up, but corrects are going up more rapidly. And so percent correct, is, which is the distance between corrects and errors, will be increasing. A worse picture is where you're, you're monitoring percent correct, and corrects are going down, except errors are going down more rapidly. Percent correct is increasing. If you're watching percent, you think he's getting better. And the day just before he gets perfect, at 99% correct, he never comes back to school. Motivation, spirit, everything went to zero. But accuracy was increasing, my dear, yeah. And given you, the finger was also increasing. And finally, he's, the very day he was about to get perfect for the teacher, he threw the towel in and sold drugs on the corner, which was exciting. He's getting high number of contacts, and maybe drug sales were slightly increasing. <laughs> That's an exciting picture. This is a boring picture. Everything's going down. So people don't realize that. A lot of wives try to stop their husband from swearing by saying, please don't, please don't swear at me, Ogden. So what happens? You've got a silent husband. Doesn't say anything. She says, he opens the door. Where are you going? Murphy's bar. Because that goddamn woman's on a bitch of where he can swear all he wants to. <laughs> so what if she was monitoring, she should monitor swear words going down, right? And she should monitor correct adjectives, and she should reward those. And she's better off with correct adjectives and swear words maintaining than she is both going down. You know what, silent man. He's no fun. Come in. Hi. How are things at work? Good. Where's supper? Thank you. Where are you going? Murphy's. <laughs> She tells the bartender, I don't know how to, how, I don't know how, why Ogden is such a good customer. He, he doesn't say anything. Oh, he talks all the time. <laughs> all he does in here is talk. I have trouble selling him beer. He's got his mouth going all the time. <laughs> but he, he wasn't punished, wasn't punished in Murphy's bar. And he was punished at home. And any questions about what independent means? Positive feelings are independent of negative feelings. 
positive social behavior is independent of negative social behavior. And it means you have to monitor both. You have to look at both the positives and the negatives and chart them both. Percent won't do it. Just watching the positives won't do it. The world thinks it's dependent. In fact, the, the whole anti-aversive people, most of them bet on the fact. But I find an opioid is consequence. Q-U-E-N. CE. And it's not the whole world thinks cause. And, and by cause, they think what came before the behavior. Like if you go into most public schools and there's a, a disturbed kid having a tantrum. <laughs> right. So bad, the teacher comes into the room. And what is, I mean, the principal comes into the room. What does the principal say? What does the principal say? What caused, him? what caused him to do that? And what's the answer? Nothing. I don't know. He hasn't stopped yet. The, the real cause, the consequences come, what happens right after that behavior ends. You watch for the tail of the behavior to see what's pushing it. Like if you see a behavior coming in the room, you say, what caused it? You don't know because its rear end isn't here yet. Watch for its tail and what's pushing that. That's the real cause of the behavior. Most people look at the front of behavior to see what causes it rather than the end of it. That's how parents get into trouble and everything. One of, one of the best procedures, if you have parents that have got a kid that they can't control, that has tantrums and things, one of the best things is to tell them about masking. And say, what do you do when your kid throws a noisy tantrum? And usually, they have to give in because eventually a neighbor will come and say, are you torturing that child or what's going on here? The neighbor will hear this shrieking and think child abuse is going on in the next apartment. The, the best procedure I've ever found to advise parents to control that situation, get a hi-fi with a lot of volume and turn the fuck, turn it up. <laughs> turn that bugger up. High. Right? So Ogden throws a tantrum. I want it! <laughs> the neighbor says, you've got a noisy people next door. Part of high fi all the time. But they'll never get you for child abuse. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? But you give the parent a technique that the parent can use to keep from, from rewarding that unwanted behavior. Get them something to mask that behavior so that they don't reward it by giving the kid something he wants at the end of it, of the end of the, the reward for the behavior. Well, is any uh, any questions about this? I'm kind of giving you more of a of a parent lecture, middle class, lower class, blue collar parent lecture, I, sort of on purpose, so that you kind of see how this stuff can make a lot of sense, and and you'll understand it rather than put it all in academic terms and university terms and all. I can talk that language if you want me to, but I won't get as many laughs. <laughs> So anybody, see that's, those are code words for things we've discovered in precision teaching that we didn't know before. And a lot of the rest of the world doesn't know. The multiply, almost all of the association behavior analysis resists that one. The unique and the specific, quite a few of uh, applied behavior analysis also agree with. They haven't got as good data as we do. They don't have as much classroom data, but they do agree with that. Uh, Donald Bear, for example, even gives rules for, for, for building specific tasks, specific things which will help produce generalization. The independent, almost nobody else believes in. They, percent correct is a very common measure of performance used by behavior analysts, and it's probably, percent is probably the worst thing that ever came to behavior. Whenever you see a percent, you should close your eyes or rechart the data, because it's, it's, it's going to lead you astray. All you're looking at, when you look at percent, is all you're looking at is the relationship between a positive behavior and a negative behavior on the chart. And 
all of these, all of these pictures here have the same percent correct. These pictures have the same percent correct. That's a terrible picture of a kid losing interest in school. This is a total waste of the teacher and the kid's time. This is not too bad a picture. He's just getting, he's getting fluent. He's getting skillful. He just mispronounces a few words. He talks sort of like he came from Boston. Everybody understands him. His pocket car in Harvard Yard's okay. She has electricity, it's all right. Everybody knows what it is. No. Most of us, when we learn to talk, learn to talk this way. We, we, we had a few errors in our speech and still do, but we got more and more fluent. We started out one every 10 minutes, one a minute, 10 a minute, and we accelerated. That's sort of the normal learning pattern. If you're too much of a perfectionist and you punish errors, you're liable to turn this down, but you're liable to turn that down with it. You're not careful. A lot of teachers make the error that they try, they try to teach accuracy before they build speed. And what do they get? Well, they get a bunch of people hating their guts. They get another bunch of people that are inchworms. They're perfect little, little inchworms. I have a hunch that it's probably 10 or 20 percent of the freshman class in a larger, a larger number of universities are almost suicidal sometime in October or November when they start getting their first hour exams back. What's the problem? Straight A through grade school, straight A through high school, and getting B minuses, C's, and D's in college. They go to the teacher, they say, Dr. Lindsley, I, I don't know what to do about my grades. I said, what's the matter? Well, I got B minus on the exam. I said, well, what's the problem? Well, I don't know. I, I couldn't finish it. Here we got absolutely perfect little Miss A, slow as a snail, spent all weekend on an English assignment in high school, got the top grade in the class. Now the English professor says, I want you to write a theme a day. I want you to turn in at least a thousand words by Tuesday. I want you to have another thousand words by Wednesday. She can't write a thousand. She had no, she's just, she's absolutely slow, perfect letters. She still like, she still dots her eyes with little circles. Such a sweet little girl. <laughs> She draws a perfect heart at the end of the letter. And she can write what, a letter an hour? No, no, I mean, a, 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 a missile, a, a letter in an envelope an hour. That, com that comes from this absolutely perfect, no errors, don't care what speed is. Well, any questions about music, what it means? And we developed that to sort of help people remember things about precision teaching. Now uh, there's some, another thing on precision teaching methods. There's another word which is called SAFMEDS. Does anybody know what that means? I mean say all Fast, a minute, each day, shuffled. And those are the rules for learning from flashcards. And I had to develop those rules because it, people are so used to taking flashcards with a fact on one side and a definition or a fact on the other side and sitting on a school bus or something and leafing through those. They don't practice with them. They study them. They, they look at them and hope it sinks in their brain. You see people all over the world. You see people in, in the libraries doing this. What are they doing? Studying. Are they learning anything? No. 
some of them are underlining crap. Well, now they're making stuff that they could later learn. They, they, they're, they're making stuff that they could, they're making something they could read faster by skipping the, only reading the yellow lines. So one of the worst things that ever got into a high school was silence in the study hall. If it's a practice hall, it should sound like a cocktail party. But all kinds of people all talking at once, practicing, saying the thing. I developed these terms because I was using these practice cards. They're supposed to be practiced a minute each day, said out loud in my class in futures at the University of Kansas. And my own wife, Nancy, was taking the class. And she said, I'm ready to time out. I think I have about 70 to 80 a minute correct. I said, fine. So she got her cards, and I, I said, please start. And she, uh, 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 stop. She had like 15. I said, what's the matter with you? It can't be anxiety. I mean, you, you said you had 70, and you only could say 15. She says, I said, how do you practice them? Show me. So she went. I said, well, all you're doing is looking. You can look at 70 a minute, but you can't say at 70 a minute. You may, you may be able to look, think. But you can't look, think, do. Being able to think 70 a minute is not the same as being able to write 70 a minute or do 70 a minute or test 70 a minute. So I realized I've, I've got to do something about I can't let people call these things cards or they will, they will practice them the way they did French cards in high school, which is almost a waste of time, really. It's a little better than doing nothing, but you might be much better off writing words than looking at cards. You've got more, more response involved. So, so say means say them all. You've got you to say something to each card. Even when you don't know what's on the card, you still should say something, because your mouth, your mouth will turn into a correct answer if you've got it working. If you, now, if you don't know the card and you say, I don't know, that's not as good because that kind of punishes you. That makes you think, oh my God, I don't know that one, I don't know that one. But we found the best thing to say when you don't know, have any idea what's on the back of that card, is go. It's short, it's brief, it's not punishing, and it tells you, keep it going, baby. I mean, that, that's one, go, go, go. When you make an error, what do you do? Go fast to something you might get right. Jump over the error. If you're a salesman and you knock on a door and the guy says, I don't want any, what do you do? Go, baby, go, the next, the next building. You, you, you don't want to waste time with this person that doesn't want to see a salesperson. But you do want to get to the next house real fast. You want to say all the cards. There's a tendency for people to want to learn 45 cards in 10 minute hunks. It's sort of traditional education. Learn the parts, put them together, know the whole. The problem is that you have a big setback when you put them together. If you learned them in 10 card hunks and then you put them together, you lose so much ground when you put them together that you've been better having them together all along. Fast means start at speed. Start at about 60 a minute. Get most of them wrong, just like with the tennis balls. A minute, you should have about a minute or at least 30 seconds each day. Each day, every day. Now, I don't know what it is about daily, but we've done all kinds of research on comparing two or three timings one day and then skip two days. In other words, two minutes every other day is not the same as one minute every day. Now, I think it's something about human beings. I think human beings have to do everything daily. Don't get thinking you save time by going to the toilet twice as much every other day. You're going to get sick. I guarantee you. And it's the same with learning. The very same thing with, we know it in athletics. We know it in athletics. You can't go out two hours for basketball every other day and get the same amount you would one hour every day. We know that. But it's exactly the same in calculus or arithmetic or anything. All the universities have worked against that. They kitted us into thinking you can drive in here one night a week. And in three hours on Tuesday night, you can get the same you could get if you came one hour on Tuesday, one hour on Thursday, one hour on Saturday. No, they're lying. They don't measure it. They're just collecting your money. They, 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 they know that you won't drive that far for three separate things. So they try to teach three massive hours once a week and pretend that you get credit hours the same. No, it's not the same. And you'd be better off with half an hour seven days a week than you would be one hour every other day. You'd be able to, and it used to be that way. I don't know if you remember. College used to be that way. There were little short 
you pra you, German German met on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It met every day. The class met. Now shuffled means you should you should change the order so you won't learn where where they come. And all practice should have shuffling in it. I don't know if you can remember your own education. How many times you said this? I, I know I know what it is. It's in the up, upper left hand corner on the same on the same page with right right triangles. That means you learned the order more than you learned the thing. And if you, if you don't shuffle that order, you do learn the order. Our order learner is better than our thing learner. I think the reason that's so is we walk around and we like to know that right after the tree comes the brook. We, we like to learn the order of things because we're, we're mobile things and, and sequence is very important to us. So our sequence learner has been going on for centuries. So that, those are our rules for learning with cards, paired associates on cards. Is there any questions about those? Now, there's some rules for practice, which I'll share with you, that we've, de we've developed a code for that. And this is Practiced is one word. So, anybody know what P is? Practice must be particular. In other words, it should be very specific to the task. And you probably should only really practice small hunks together. Uh, direct instruction is very good at breaking practice up into little particular segments. And very good at, at simplifying those segments. Like, I never did learn the silent E junk and all that and, and learning English, English spelling and English grammar, that sort of a thing. But Ziggy Engelman, who developed uh, direct instruction, sort of studied that and made a simple rule where he said, letters have, letters have sounds and they have names. And if, uh, if, if it's a CV, a consonant vowel sound word, like if, if the word is, if the word is cat, and if there's, if there's an E on the end, say the letter name. And if there's no E on the end, say the letter sound. So this would be what? Cat. And this would be K, right? This would be Dad. Dad. And this would be Dave. And so you would practice, a practice sheet would have a bunch of these on it. And the rule would be, if there's an E on the end, say the name. It could be, what's this one? Sit, and this one is I sight. See, that's kind of a, a neat simplification of that silent E rule because it gives the kids a reason for knowing the letter name separate from the letter sound. That's kind of a direct instruction rule. But the business of making practice sheets like this with maybe a hundred of these, all different combinations on one sheet of paper, that's a precision teaching practice sheet made for a one minute timing. And what's R? Rapid. So that's another way of saying you should, in the SAP meds, you should say all fast. You should, you should start out full speed, fast as you can go. And accuracy comes later. What's A? You should set aims. But you shouldn't just say go as fast as you can, but you should, you should on the chart, you should put a, uh, you should put an aim on the chart. And well, I'll put one here. You should, 
say, now, now we're at, say, 20 per minute wrong and 4 per minute correct. And our aim is 70 per minute correct in one, two, three, four weeks, by Monday of the fifth week. And the arms of the aim star are on 70 a minute, and the point of the star is on the day that we decided to try to hit it. We found that if you set these aims, kids are much more apt to beat them, not hit them, beat them, than if, than if you don't set them. Especially if the kid draws his own aim star and, and chose his aim in discussion with the teachers and the rest of the kids. Like Tony says, uh, I, I'm going to try to hit 60 a minute by Monday the second week. And the teacher says, Ogden, what, what are you going to hit? Oh, hell, probably 80. <laughs> I'm kind of doing a thing on Tony, you see what I mean? And so, okay, Tony says, can I change my aim? Teacher says, no, yours is okay. But Tony, Tony tries to beat my 80. And so it's okay to have kids competing for their rate of growth. They don't get angry, they don't wet their pants, they don't have that little soul's crush. They like it just like they do in basketball. As long as it's honest, they can chart their score and they can see the result. But anyway, that, that's what the AIMS means, and that's what the particular or rap in, in medicine, it doesn't make you well, it tells, it tells you if you're getting well it, it, or, or getting more sick. It, it monitors the treatment. What C counted, counted by the learner. better off with lousy counts by the learner, I, 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 inaccurate counts by the learner, than you are highly accurate counts by the teacher or the teacher's aide. Kids will eventually learn to count more accurately. But if, if they're doing the counting, it's more, even though they're lying, it's more their count. Sometimes we've, we've let a kid lie for two, three weeks on his chart. How many did you get, Ogden? 120. There we go. <laughs> That's all right. Put it down. 120, 120. And someday, like two or three weeks later, you'll say 24. Everybody will say, what? Oh, how did it go from 120 to 24? Well, I started counting different stuff. <laughs> he, he, he started to be honest. He was just blowing his own head. He, he wasn't getting any place with his lives. They weren't turning into A's or anything like that, because A's were all performance-based, you see. Same question about counted. T, what's T? Timing. Again, best by learner. What I did was a teacher timing, but it's better. A lot of uh, public school classrooms have their timings. The kids do their timings all by themselves. They aren't part of the instruction. They're done separately. And. Uh, like the kids compete to, to make a timing tape. So they, they, they make a cassette that once every minute, they've, they've taken two cassette players and tied them together. And then on the one that they're copying the music onto will be the timer. And then they'll sit, and the one that's playing the music on the new tape, they'll watch a, a wristwatch, a sweep second hand, and every minute they'll turn the sound down for a second and back up. And then wait a minute, turn the sound down again. So the timing tape has, has holes in the music, like a one or two second hole in the music every, every minute. And they'll come to school, hang up their coat, go to the tape recorder, put their, their music on. And, and, and then other kids come in and sit and do their timings with a friend, do their math timings or their reading timings. They're counting by themselves, they're timing by themselves. They don't have to watch a clock or anything because the music, the music makes its own hole. The, the, the hole comes in the music, which tells them the minute is up. The minute is up. And the minute. So they like they time for a minute, and then they'll correct papers for a minute, and then they'll catch the next hole and time for a minute and go on. What's I informed? In other words, 
the, the results of this should be told the learner, or ideally the learner themselves should put it on their own, their own chart. In other words, they, they should know their results. They should correct their results. They should somehow be informed of which ones are correct and which ones are wrong. If they don't do it themselves, then their, co their friend, their coach, their peer does it. What's C? You ought to get that one charted. In other words, it's not enough to count time and look at the timings, but it should be put on a chart so you can see trends. What's E? Errorful. Ideally, you'd have more errors than corrects. More learning is going on when errors are going out than when just corrects are coming in. And the, the steeper the error, going out, the more you're learning, more rapidly you're learning. All really, all really skillful people are that way. When you hear really good musicians practicing, they're not sounding perfect. They're playing the thing so damn fast, they're making mistakes at triple time, quadruple time. Good, good basketball players are, are, are moving so fast on the court and practice and everything, they're missing a lot of those shots. But you want to practice faster with more errors than you want to perform. You want to come down the mountain faster in your practice and slalom than, than you'll have to to win the race. And you'll total a lot of the time. You'll spin out and hit posts and everything else. And what's D? Remember I told you about how often to go to the bathroom, how often to pray? Every day. Right? And if you're going to do it twice a day, what you should do? All at once? No, no, no. A little bit in the morning, a little bit at night. Almost all religions tell you that. Some of the more formal religions say that you should, the first thing you should do in the morning is praise God for such a wonderful day. First thing you should do at breakfast is thank you for, for bringing up some food, you know. And just, just, so spot check this communication with your maker through the day. It's much more effective. You should do the same thing if you want to impress your lover. You shouldn't send her $47 worth of roses once a week. Right? If you're going to do roses, you'll do a rose every morning. You're getting a little more into it there. Hug her and kiss her four times a day and say, I wish I had the money to buy you a rose. You certainly deserve it. <laughs> More regular, more often, daily, broken up into parts. Well, all the research that's been done shows that, but we don't do it. Space practice is more effective than mass practice. Psychology spent 25 years on that joint, but they didn't pay attention to the results. The, the, the university course that teaches that is taught three hours a day, once a day, once a week. Bang, Tuesday nights, 7 to 9.30. Space practice beats mass practice. <laughs> Any questions about what practice? And there's one other, like our, our slogan, our full slogan is, is practice, music, and then the next, the next word is reaps, fun. So, so those are like our, our kind of key words. And when you learn something to fluency, in other words, not only, not only are you accurate, but you can do it at 100, 100 per minute or 90 per minute, you have more retention. In other words, you will remember it longer. You have more endurance. You can do it for longer periods of time. When, when, in, when you can do something at 100 a minute in one minute, you're more apt to be able to do the same thing for five minutes without pausing than if you only can do it at 30 a minute for one minute. You won't have much endurance if you're not fluent. Application means, means application that you can do this in more different settings. The more fluent you are, the more it resists the more general it becomes, the more, the less specific it is, and the more it is apt to occur in different situations. And P means you have performance standards. In other words, you don't have to say he got A in spelling, but you say he can spell 
all of the high school vocabulary list at 35 words spelled correctly per minute or at 110 words correctly per minute with no errors per minute. You can, you can make a standard based upon the performance. And S means more stable. You know, if you're fluent, if you know something by heart, you're less disturbed by anxiety, you're less worried by a cold, you're, you can do it when you're drunk, you can do it when you're scared. It, it's criminal to take uh, minority group kids or inner city kids or poor, poor white trash, anything like that, and, and not bring them up to fluency, but send them to get a job when they're just merely able to do it. They can't type at 110 a minute now. They can type like at 40 a minute. And that behavior is so fragile under the scare of going in this big, this big business and all that, it'll fall apart. It's not stable behavior. Now, the military knows this and it has for centuries. I was in the Army Air Force in 1941 and 1942 and I had to learn 11044291, sir. That was my army serial number, and I was an enlisted man, so I had to have a sir on it. Well, I could get so drunk, I lost my hat, I vomited on my uniform, and the, all, the, you know, the shore police and the military police come up in New Orleans, Louisiana, they say, Soldier, 1104 sir. It just comes out. But it's, 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 it's learned, it's fluent. And if you learn things to retention, it's more fun, it's more fun to do fluent things. If you've learned something so well that you can play it at 100 or 200 a minute, you usually want to know more about it. In other words, people almost demand understanding. When, like when you teach them the code words for airports and you teach them at the level of fluency, they begin to ask you questions like, they, they just want to know, well, why, why is Cincinnati, why is Cincinnati CVG, Dr. Lindsley? Ah, oh, you don't worry about it, you learned it, who cares? But I want to know, why isn't it CIN? Or C I said, well, it happens to be the airport in Cincinnati is across the river in Covington, Kentucky. But they ask you that kind of question only when they become fluent. It's like unfinished business. They, they got these things in their head and they're deep, deep, deep in their head and they want to know why, why there's a peculiar thing like that. So it's, it's really true that if you forget understanding, produce fluency, and the kids will demand understanding. They, they kind of want to know before they let you off the hook. And the nice one is no cheating. There's no way in the world you can cheat at 120 a minute. It just slows you down too much to look over there. It slows you down too much to look in the hem of your skirt. You, you'll flunk, not by getting them wrong, you'll flunk, you won't, you won't get enough done. You won't be able to sneak a peek fast enough to get, to get a high, high grade. It's just, so we totally overlook cheating and the whole fluency thing. And, uh, once in a while, obviously, somebody's been faking his count or something, but that just drops out. So those are the key words for precision teaching. Does anybody have an, uh, any more of what they are? Practice? S say them out loud with me. Practice, music, music, music reaps, reaps fun, right? Say it again. Practice, Practice music, reaps, fun. Now say it with feeling. <laughs> Practice, music, reaps, fun. Now say it with some rhythm. Practice music reaps fun. There you go. Practice music reaps fun. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Old-time religion. What? The old-time religion. That was new-time religion. <laughs> the old-time religion. So, anybody any questions about this? Any of this? What happens? Yeah. What happens? What happens if they're unable to understand? They're unable to understand, comprehend aims, and they're unable to count themselves. Well, you start. Probably start with counting. I mean, okay, it's probably start with counting, and you probably, probably, you don't have probably start with something like magic markers and masking tape. 
so you, you have this on their hand, or you have this on the thing, and uh, they're trying to, uh, you're trying to teach them to uh, initiate conversation, something like that, right? And, uh, or you're trying to, teach, lower than that, you're trying to teach them to respond to conversation. So I say, hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Right. Well, mark one down. That's one. Now it's best. It's best if I if he won't put the mark down, I put it down myself. I'm trying to be careful not to get it on his shirt. Please. That you sort of guide him like that. And so at the end of the day, we have a bunch of these. And so we started this in special ed in '65, and the kids used to call these stickies. And they would have one stickies for the for the goods they're trying to make up, and there'd be another sticky for the things they're trying to decelerate. You always should have a pair. Uh, something you're trying to make more of, and something you're trying to make less of. But you're quite right. You you have to start way back. And you can see most of the teaching that most of us are doing is going over the kids' heads. The kids can't do the stuff we're trying to. To, to get into them or something. They can't respond to it. They don't know what it is. And we're writing numbers down. They don't know what the numbers mean. In general, you're better off with lousy counts. In other words, he, he, today he did 12 of them and he only counted eight. We're better off with him counting eight than we are me counting 12. Eventually, he'll get so out of 12, he'll count 11. Him responding, now you said throughout the day. Right? <coughs> now, him responding throughout the day is in context. Okay, hi, Tony. He doesn't respond. He put a mark on his, on his piece of tape, right? How do you get the time? You know, if you're going to figure it out, wait for a minute on the chat. The well, line. that would, if that was all day, that would be all day. If that was just for a class session, that would be, say, 50 minutes or 30 minutes. So, would you, do, would you try to make conversation? Once an hour, or, or once every half hour, or you know. That's not as important. That's not as that's only important when you start worrying about what percent of the things is he responding to or something. The main thing is getting talking, and so you just start there, and you don't first you don't care whether you had to hit him or what to get the talk out. What if you try to? Uh, have them distinguish between a nickel and a penny. A what? A nickel and a penny? All right. You want them to be able to, if somebody says, give me a nickel, please, you want them to be able to give you a nickel. Uh huh. All right, let's say they go into the candy store. That would be a nickel, please. Now, that already, 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 you're making some, 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 some things that are, are, not, uh, are not good precision teaching practice. Already, you don't have what we call a free operant. You should have enough things. Right. Let's say you put out a lot of, a lot of pennies. Well, that's very different than asking them to give you a penny. That's very different. So you, you've got to have more things than he can do in the time you're asking him to do it. More than you can do in the time you're asking him to do it. So you have. That's why we have practice sheets. So you can have like a hundred pennies and a hundred uh, nickels on one on one eight and a half by eleven practice sheet pictures of a hundred of those like that and say okay please start mark the nickels he does it okay count them up how many right how many pennies got marked by mistake not so many wrong and then with the practice sheets we usually have them covered up so we don't waste a lot of paper we have them covered up with with a, a page protector and we mark on them with a washable pen so you just erase that up. Okay, now mark the pennies. Okay, now put one mark on the pennies and a dot on the nickels. You try different ways of doing this. Now, if you're not careful, they'll be learning the same order. So you've got to have some practice sheets of shuffled order. Or if you only have one practice sheet, you've got to start them in different places so they don't learn the order too much. So we have practice sheet generators that are made by, for a computer that will make 20 different shufflings of the same practice sheet. Well, will this be generalized to the real objects? That's, you know, if you go for a practice sheet, you... That's the first step. That's the first step. Then the generalization is, okay, well, I found point, to the, point to the nickels. 
as fast as you can. Point to the pennies as fast as you can. Pick up the nickels. But I found with the real objects, sometimes they can give you uh, the first, you know, like, if you try and do wait for a minute, let's say you got 25 pennies, 25 nickels on the table. Give me the nickel, please. And give me the nickel. Then you say, give me the nickel, please. He says, oh, gee, I must have given the wrong thing the first time, so I'll give him a penny. <laughs> well, yeah, that's because you've got a controlled operant, too. That's part of the problem. But if you say, push all the nickels over here, or drop all the nickels in the cup, then you got a free offering. You didn't really have a free offering. You had, no, you, had, you, had, no, you had several objects, and you have what we call a controlled offering, which is single trial. So instead of having him question, which he's assuming that he's got the wrong answer, because he doesn't have the comprehension level to, to uh, say, oh, gee, did I do the wrong thing? He, he, he doesn't say, well, if I gave him the right thing the first time, so I'm going to give him the right thing again. Well, I don't know. You know it, it, I'm going to give him the nickel. I gave him the nickel the first time. He's, he's now asking to give him the nickel, so he gets a penny. I don't know why. I don't know. It's in the cup. I, I don't know why he doesn't learn it. But I do know the best way for learning is with many opportunities and more than he can do and with short timings. Now, if one minute timing is too long, you start with a 10 second sprint or a 30 second sprint till you build up enough endurance. Some of them can't go for one minute. I mean, you, you time one minute, and the end of the minute, they're not doing it, and they haven't done them all yet, and they're putting their finger in the nose, or they're diddling around, they're doing something, they lost interest. So you do five seconds. And you've got to go way back, and build up, build up from five seconds to 10 seconds to 30 seconds, build it up. So that makes, you know, when you said, you know, pretty awkward, put all the nickels in the cup, please, and then you, whatever you does put in the cup, you then you count how many wrong, how many right you put in the cup. That makes, that makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. Well, that's what, it's, that's what free operant was. That's what it should be. And this thing of uh, responding to a request is, is, comes way after they've learned made these other discriminations. You don't, tell the, you don't tell the pigeon to hit the green bar until long after he's learned green from red and all that. Then, then you bring it under stimulus control after you've built the behavior. You're trying to, you're trying to make the stimulus <laughs> come before you've built the behavior. You're trying to make it do it for you before you can do it for your own damn self. I don't know how to say it. Well, he, he, let's say when, he, when you ask him, you know, you long before you teach your son to say, you say, Ralph, tie your shoes. Long before you try that, you've got to make sure that he can tie and untie his shoes 15 to 20 times a minute. Because it'd be very unfair to ask him to do something for you that he can't even do for himself. And the way you know he can do it for himself is he can run through a bunch of these in a free offering without any pressure, without any strain. If you, if you tell a kid, say, touch your nose as many times as you can in a minute, and he does. And you say, all right, touch your nose. Touch your nose. Touch your nose. Three fail to follow commands in a row. <laughs> You shouldn't, you shouldn't be permitted to command him to do something until you say, touch your nose as many as you can. Or he does, no, no, that's not a touch. That's just one giant touch. You're supposed to do on, off, on, off, on, oh, 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 oh. Now you're in a position. If he can do this 60 or 70 minutes, now it's fair to demand of him, touch your nose for me, Tony. Everybody ready? Please start. Okay, please stop. <laughs> Share with your neighbor. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. How many got zero? How many won? Two? Three? Four or five? Six, seven, or eight? That's just one, right? Uh, nine, ten, eleven, or twelve? Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, or seventeen? Thirteen, that Eighteen, Now, one problem was I cut you at thirty seconds. So some, most of you was how many were still writing at thirty seconds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to, now to give a proof for that, say I was the teacher. And I thought that a one minute, that we were ready for a one minute timing. Now, we really didn't, we weren't so fragile, we needed a 30 second sprint, right? I would just do it over again. So, okay, let's do the same thing over again now. Turn the sheet over or something. We'll do it for one minute. Okay? Let's, let's do that. So now we're going to abbreviate, abbreviate facts about precision teaching as many as we can. This time is a one minute timing. Okay, please start. Thank you very much. And most of you are writing whole words rather than just abbreviating, which is slowing you up. You could have been just writing initials. So count up how many, trade with your neighbor and count up how many you've got. Two. What? <laughs> I'm times two. <laughs> Almost times two. Over the first one? Over the first one. Yeah. That's good. Okay. How many how many had less had three or or less or more? Four or five? Six, seven, and eight. Uh, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. 
One, two, three, four, five. One, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. One, two, three, four, five. Anybody have 25 or over? What was your? 28. 28. <laughs> okay. And what was yours? Yeah, what? 52? No, I wrote them practice, but you said that as one. Did you write practice and practice <laughs> now you know in, in reality if you don't if you don't if you don't do anything very heavy with these numbers if these numbers are just like like numbers in sports or something nobody's made the team or lost the team yet it's just they're all just performance numbers we're trying to get better at there's no competition it's a lot of fun so how would you find this, the center of these the, the the middle is the best measure of the center of central Tennessee. So we would count up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. The middle would be which? If we got 19 things. Which one's got just as many above as below? 10. 10, right? It's got 9 above and 9 below. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the middle's right in there. And we usually make a mark like that. Now this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the middle's up in here. So we increased in the th the 30-second timing. We increased from about like about 1.5 up to two, or we, it's not quite a doubling. It's probably like a 1.5ing, 1.6ing, something like. This time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's pretty much the same. Is there any questions about that? How, how you can you can see see a distribution on on this? How you can make them? Are there any more questions about precision teaching? Any more questions you have? In, in general, you probably you're probably better off. You probably should have the person doing more than one. It's probably best to have two or three when you start a teaching sequence, have, a, have the person getting at least two or three correct and maybe 15, 20, 30, 40 wrong before you actually start the practice sessions on that material. And aids, memory aids like this are useful in the beginning and, and they they eventually, as fluency builds up, they drop out. <clears throat> I, I find I can't, I can't remember these, I can't do a talk like this without any notes and everything from scratch. Without something like this, I, I forget. I, I, over, I go back to my hotel and say, oh, I forgot, I forgot to do fluency or something. This fluency, this is what fluency produces here. Fluency produces retention, endurance, applications, performance standards, that sort of thing. That means high frequency performance. The trouble with most education is we, we know we haven't made them fluent, but, but the people who built the curriculum assume that in writing numbers, when you get into long division, you'll have to write so numbers you'll become fluent at numbers. And the fact of the matter, it doesn't happen. It's just slower and the more and more held back by their fluency. I myself don't really write anywhere near fast enough. And I know why, because I was an undergraduate engineering major and they made us print everything. So I got all these print strokes caught up in my writing. And it's just printing is a lot slower than cursive. Uh, 
given given our population of students here and, and the, the task our teachers face, do you have an opinion on whether they should try and, and put many things within the teaching day on this sort of track or concentrate more on one thing at a time or a couple of things rather than trying to teach many different tasks? I, I don't know. I My hunch is that we're probably trying to teach at too high a level all the time and the kids don't have the tool skills at the fluency that they would need and and we we just haven't bitten the bullet we haven't realized that probably this whole building including half the staff should be doing numbers and sequence and, and but with some of your kids you don't you don't even have basic math you don't even have grasp graph you don't even have point above 10 a minute or something I mean, you got a guy who, 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 who doing something like that, and you're trying to teach him to write his name. Well, hell, he can't even point to a spot. So you should, you should get point up to, I'm very serious, point, get pointing up to 100 a minute. Uh, the computer program for point is too slow. I mean, yeah, he's putting his finger in the hole, but my God, none of them should have been rewarded. They're all too slow. It just, you, yeah. <laughs> guy couldn't even swat a fly. <laughs> I, you know, that's, uh, I don't. What? You have to go to FR1 at 100 a minute before you go to FR10. Right. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's my general feeling, mm -hmm. and and probably a lot of motor a lot of motor training should be going on. A lot of this stuff, like I'm showing, a lot of these free operant basketball stuff. And I can't, I can't, you know, the, the the biggest the biggest problem I had in special ed was most special ed teachers are taught to guide children. And they became special ed teacher because they like to do that. They like to hold them. They like to help them. They, they, they like to they like to hand them the thing, give them the thing, hand them the thing, give them the thing. So they're always in the kid's behavior. Mm -hmm. One of the best example of that is that one of the first first things I automated or made a free operant out of at KU Med Center was orthopedically handicapped classroom. And they had kids climbing stairs. And they had three steps with a teacher along the side of it. I'm not kidding you. And then the kid, the kid would, the kid would, and the teacher's holding a hand, and the kid, like that, and like that, and the kid would get to the top, and what do you think would happen? Teacher. They'd pick him up and put him back at the beginning. We should come down. I mean, there isn't any stairs in the world except heaven that you go in one direction. <laughs> You got to come down. So they, they didn't they didn't make him turn around right. and come down. Lift him up. They lift him up and start over. It's so all over the place. You see teachers resetting kids. Mm -hmm. Teachers resetting the problems on the page. Teachers teachers checking whether they're right or wrong. Kids should be doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, put the nickels in the cup. Well, who counts how many are in there? He should. How does he count them? Well, he could take them out and put them and put them on a counting sheet. And then, and then point to the number underneath. All of that is stuff that kids should be doing for themselves. And the kids get in the practice. When they go home at night, the kids worn out. Now when you go home at night, the teacher's worn out. Teacher did all the behavior all day long. Resetting kids, counting kids, making charts, putting on timers, pushing button, pulling jump, 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 jump. The kids just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my, my feeling, that, that there's all kinds of basic performances that could be put into very nice little free operants. Now another thing that you can do, and we've done a lot of, is where older kids time and, and practice younger kids. You do like cross-age practicing. And they really like that. They really like helping another kid. But if you're locked into this is this classroom and these are this age and this is this classroom and this age, you can't you can't get anything out of cross age tutoring there because it's not available. No. What about the intact kids are, do, are are making like marks on state capitals and the aides are counting what the the, the ball catchers are doing in the basement room. So mm -hmm. what about mixing functioning levels? I don't know. Having a 
you know, a higher functioning, what we call a higher functioning kid helping a lower functioning kid, all those kinds of things. I don't know. I, I, that takes a major policy decision, I imagine. But uh, and maybe a state law against it. I don't know. Maybe the unions. I don't. I don't. I don't know anything about. All, all I know is how to make the best learning, how to make the most efficient learning, and. Uh, it's it's really a lot of fun in, on the stuff, but almost everything you can you can count, and almost everything you can time, and almost everything has a frequency, and you'd be really surprised by the differences in them. Do you have other questions? What's your name? I forgot. George. 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 What? Collins. C O L L I N S. <laughs> what? Is that what it is? C O L L I N S. C O L L I N S C O L L I N S C O L L I N S. Now, what you said was that basically, if you can put it in a free operant state, right? Then it's better to be put in a free operant state. But if the student hasn't learned it yet, then it's best not to be chatting it. No, no, almost always. Okay. Almost always, almost always, you should, when you go back to very beginning behaviors, very primitive behaviors, they almost always should be free operants. You never should, you never should try to uh, guide them or something. I know it takes longer. I know it, it takes longer, but over, it, it's only it only seems to take longer at the very beginning because you you you, you get to your eventual goal much quicker with with the learner performing almost all of the action rather than you resetting it or stimulating it or, or requesting it or guiding it or in any way in, involved in the thing. But this has to be in addition to normal. <laughs> Normal teaching of the task. Well, this I don't know what normal teaching is. But well, this should be the practice. This should be practice. Now, these the really powerful precision teaching programs where people are doing this all day long say 60 to 70 percent of the day should be practice, should be timed practice. And some of the places that call themselves big precision teaching places will have that only be 10% of the day will be time practice and all the rest will be old-fashioned teaching with teachers at chalkboards and people at overheads and things like that. If I, if I wanted to bring you guys up to speed on these abbreviations, we wouldn't be doing anything else but them for the whole rest of the day. And then, and then we'd, we'd do a couple tomorrow and a couple tomorrow. And in about a week, you'd all know practice music reaps fun, whatever that's worth. But the biggest criticism of most public schools is there's almost no practice. It's, it's just like sports. What, what percent of basketball is chalkboard and what percent is practice? And something like 60 or 70 percent is out there throwing things around. And only a little bit of the, the drill and stuff. And it's exactly the same thing with it's exactly the same thing with academics. Now the problem is most curriculum doesn't have enough practice sheets. It's, it's the first problem you get into is where, where you're going to get all this practice. Most public school curriculum got like ten problems at the end of eight pages or something, or four pages. There's ten problems. <laughs> you gotta have at least a hundred and then you've got to shuffle those. So the first thing that came up was practice sheet generators and practice sheet collections. And I think you have the Great Falls collections here, and you also have you have the text practice sheet maker for the Macintosh. And you probably don't have yet have the graphics one because that was just only recently released. But there's one that makes lots of little pictures, like clock handles and clock faces and shapes of states and uh, the signs, the little signs that have the, the cross through them, don't drink, don't smoke, don't this, don't that, and traffic signs, and uh, you could have uh, the, the Burger King signs could all be on a practice sheet if you wanted to teach them. You could have like, you could have like 15 signs shuffled in different order a, a hundred times on one 8 by 11 sheet. Uh, 
could be made with, with a graphics practice sheet that could make that. Is this, is this kind of what you thought it would be? Is this different than you thought it would be, or the same? Or have any feelings about that? Or? All it really is, is is a system of monitoring and a system of practicing. That's really what it is. But from that has been discovered some things like multiply and lack of generalization. And you start with low frequencies. And, and we probably don't have all those principles into code letters yet. You know, uh, we just discovered where to obtain the precision teaching uh, practice sheet <coughs> storehouse because the place in Florida is out of business. I know, I know. And, uh, it's uh, Shoppers West in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. All these practice sheets, which later were reproduced by Great Falls, Montana, when it had uh, a distribution model for precision teaching for the uh, National Education, National Department of Education, the USDEA or something, had 20 models of, of, of types of teaching to dispense. And Great Falls took those Washington practice sheets and reproduced them, added some of their own, and made three books. And one was, I think, basic math, one was advanced math, and one was language arts. And they're all about that thick. They're all very heavy. All they are is eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper with problems on them at all different levels. Yeah, that's what we're going to buy yeah. from the software. So much more sophisticated, much more powerful than that. At the high end are the materials produced by Morningside Learning Center, which is Kent Johnson's outfit. And he has, he has taken the best of direct instruction and the best of Tiemann Markle's instructional design and put those together. And direct instruction doesn't have enough practice built into it. It has some, but not enough. And direct instruction, even though direct instruction says you should practice more non-examples than positive examples. See, most, most instruction will give you a positive example, but, but sometimes not even any negative example. Non, they call them non-examples or negative examples. In other words, when, when, most, when most books it's not. It's pretty hard to understand it. When most books are trying to teach right angle, they will have that, and they will have that, and they might have this, something like that. And those are right angles. So those are all positive instances. There's no negative instances there. There's, there's, not, there's none of these. Well, I haven't made it here. <laughs> That's, they, they, they don't have, and the other thing, when they do the right triangles, they, they don't put them, they always put them vertical. So the person learns two sides, vert, one side vertical, one side horizontal. They don't learn what a right triangularity really is. So direct instruction says you should have probably two to three times more non-examples than you do positive examples for every concept. In, in other words, if you're trying to teach, if you're trying to teach this is a pencil, you should say this is a pencil, this is not 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 a pencil. This is a pencil. That's the kind of demonstration you should have, according to the research done by direct instruction. And most, a lot of American instruction is like this, and some is like that. And almost none of it has a whole mess of, of non-examples. But Kent Johnson has made practice sheets which have these features which the, the Great Falls ones don't really have and also go to higher levels like teaching how to write paragraphs and all that sort of thing. Do they sell them? Yeah, they're expensive as hell. I think the, I think the whole I think the whole Morningside model is like $897 or something but it's powerful. You know, he, he guarantees 
two to three grade levels of gain per year for just regular special ed kids or money back. And they've never had to give their money back. And then working with Job Corps people, he's getting, in six weeks, he's getting two grade level gains in two subject matter, two different subject matters. In six weeks, 30 minutes a day practice, which is really powerful. With, with all of them, not just two or three of them, all of them. Right now, that model is being developed and used in Malcolm X College in Chicago. And it's work, really working. And the crazy thing is, they are averaging. In fact, Joe Lang, who's running that, uh, Joe Lang, who's running that Malcolm X College program, told me that I should make, I should make a thing for the chart. He just told me this a week ago. I should make uh, an overlay for the chart. They had times two built right in it. I should make a thing for the chart. It had, the, or had a plastic times two line that you could slide along and you could tell if your learning is not above times two, you've got to change something. So he's averaging doubling per week on those high school dropouts that are in Malcolm X Community College in, in the, I forget the area in Chicago, it's a south side, south, a little bit west, southwest side of Chicago. And they're tough kids. They've all been in dope and drugs and gangs and the whole thing. But and they're put, they're they're doubling. Now, see, the, I, I've known that's possible. Owen White, who wrote a book on precision teaching, they call exceptional teaching. He had he had a line about 1.25. He had a line about one, about that steep. That he said is is it should be the aim for special education learning, 1.25 per week. I know that's crazy because I've got kids multiplying by four and by 16 just by chance, just by being turned on. And if a kid can go times four per week, you don't want to set an aim of times 1.25. That's like taking an automobile that can go 80 miles an hour and, and saying, well, let's, let's go 15 miles an hour down to South County for a swim. That's, that's crazy. So, so I, I've known doubling could be a game, and it's being achieved right now. All the learners in Malcolm X Community College Precision Teaching Learning Program are doubling their performance every week. So uh, back on the pinpoint, you should, you should go back to something that these learners can do and can learn rapidly enough and can double every week on it. Such a primitive skill. I don't know what it's grasping, pointing, I don't know what it is, but you should back up to real simple stuff. And once you get that stuff fluent, once you get them so they can do those things, you can build on these later skills. But for, for uh, more, you know, more adult learners or more for Hope Academy, you probably should get a hold of the Morningside materials because they're really powerful. Are there any other questions? Mary Ellen, do you have any questions? Is this kind of like you thought it would be? Or? No, actually, it was better than I thought it would be. Better? More informative than I thought. Oh. Well, I thought you were going to give us the college lecture you gave us the, the lower level. Yeah. I, I, this is my college lecture. No, it was, uh, no I, have, I have learned that you, I have learned that if you put this in big words, they don't understand it. No, not just this, not just the production manager at Hercules Powder doesn't understand it, but the professor of education doesn't understand it. <laughs> The catch-22 is the professor of education is, is, his feelings are hurt when I talk small words at him. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, they get pissed off. <laughs> they do. Well, I, I, they, they, one, one, guy, one guy, I said, did you understand it? He <coughs> said, yeah, he says, but something really bothered me. He says, what? He says, you put it in the language of the streets. That's a university professor telling you that. It's too earthy. It'll never make it. I said, well, it can't go the other way. What he was talking about was something we didn't have time to share, and that is, how do you describe a, a, a change? I don't know if you've talked about it, but uh, like, 
when, when a behavior is going along like this, and then you do something, and it changes. You, you had an effect. We needed words to describe whatever, whatever that, that change is. And, you know, it's, it, mathematically, it's a step function. Uh, we used, in the beginning, we talked about it, it divided the frequency and divided the acceleration. So we talked about frequency dividers and acceleration dividers. The professor smiles and doesn't know a damn thing. He doesn't know what happened. He doesn't remember what happened. So in teaching it to elementary school kids and kindergarten kids and teachers and parents, we decided to call anything that goes up and down a chart is a jump. So that's a, a jump down and a turn down. And you abbreviate it, <laughs> JDTD. What's this one? That's no jump, no turn. <laughs> What's this one? What's that one? Jump up, no turn. You gotta have them both. Jump up, no turn. What's this one? Jump down, jump down no turn. Right. That is clear. It's as clear as a bell. You make sense out of it, and then it works fine. But it's pretty simple talk. But you know, when when you when you're confused or it's snowing, that's how everybody talks. When when, when you say, well, you know, how how do you get from how do you get from here to Cumberland? <laughs> Ice and the roads and people off the road and everything. You you don't say that it's a. From here, the, uh, the angle of the road is probably 93 degrees. You say, go up here about half a mile, and the road jumps left, and then watch it because it turns a sharp left. That's the English that you use, the language of childhood. Jump, turn, in, out, up, down. I, I really, I had to do that. I couldn't keep track of this stuff myself until we developed these simple words. Now, if what you're referring to in this presentation, it was uh, simpler than you thought, uh, me almost saying the F word or something, no, that, that, that I kind of uh, sometimes put in and sometimes don't. I, I try to keep, people's, keep people listening. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, does any, have any questions about this? Any? No, I think it's a really, it's a good place for us to start. I think that what you were saying to us the other day is true that, um, especially all of us who are teachers, we come out of college with a whole different you know, view of things. And, and I think it was real helpful that you kept it at the yeah. sort of level that we can understand. And um, I'm surprised to see how many things we aren't doing this way that would make a whole lot more sense. If you did them this way. Right, if we did them this I know, way. I know. Um, I'm also surprised to see how many things we do do that we didn't realize that we were doing that were right. So I think we're, we're sort of on the road. We just, we just need a little more direction. And I think this probably provides the direction for us, but we need to... Um, See, well, once once you get used to this, you can almost look out in the world. And you can see, you you can see people going for basketball practice or football practice. You can tell whether they're a real team or just people hacking around. If if the manager's got a, a net bag with 15 footballs in it, and there's another manager with another 15 football, that's a head. I don't care whether it's junior high. That's a heads up coach. There's, something's going to happen with that team. If they're going off with two footballs for, for 16 guys, nobody's going to handle the ball. In two hours, they'll handle the ball maybe five minutes. You know, it's the same with golf. I don't know if you have or tennis. Do you ever pass a tennis court or something? If there's some guy, if there's some guy there just lobbing tennis balls, and he's, and he's, you know, there's nobody in the other court, but there's balls all over the damn place. He's practicing. He's you know, it surprised me when you were talking that my son is in first grade, and he brings home um, lots and lots of, of drill sheets. I guess is what you would call it. And and I thought to myself sometimes, for God sakes, how many more times are we going to add four and three? You know, but when I'm sitting here thinking about it, if you say to my six-year-old, what's four and three? Says seven. If you say to another six-year-old, they'll say four, five, six, seven. 
So really, they are building up little things. Except he probably isn't timing them. That's the problem. No, he's not. They do something called the Mad Minute. So they do, once a day, they do time. There, There is a, some element of precision teaching. And I'm sure if I were to say to his teacher, that's what she's doing, she would know what I meant. But, um, but it, it was kind of interesting to me that, you know, I was getting kind of irritated with this girl. She's constantly coming home. But, but he really is quick. I mean, he knows if somebody says to him, what, 74, he says, yeah. You know, and there are other six-year-olds who are still, you know, adding two and two and having to think about it. So I can see that it is helpful. But that school probably won't be doing that kind of thing in sixth grade. The further they go up, the, t the less they tend to, to have drill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this is a new curriculum just started this year that, that they started using. And the teacher is, she's not too sure that she likes it. Because well, you know, I, I really, I'm feeling very guilty because I should probably make a parent's kit. And uh, there's a couple of guys I think that we might do it. And I met a guy on the plane who really liked this idea and, and he said, well, do you have anything for parents? I said, well, we started with parents, but it's, we somehow got off into public schools. And my own, my own grandchildren don't have, uh, are, are moving up into second and third grade and they're just being butchered. I mean, well, they're, they're pretty bright kids, so they're in the top, top third of their class. but. Steve Graff, who's helped pretty important builder of precision teaching, uh, has a daughter named Kim, and he taught her not only academics with one-minute timings and practice sheets and flash staff meds and things, but also athletics. And she won the world free throw contest in basketball, 25 out of 25, when she was a high school senior. And she. She didn't, I tried to talk her into applying to Stanford and Harvard. I know she could probably walk in. Her, Harvard's a, her father's a professor at Youngstown State University. She's from the Midwest. She's a top athlete. She's top grade. She's Wilson Scholar, all this stuff, you know. And she could go to Harvard. She'd go any place. And, uh, but she did. She applied to places like Oberlin and uh, there's another very ritzy private school in Ohio, we're not far away. Anyway, she got full scholarships to both of those ritzy Ohio schools. Now, they're not worth 23,000 a year like, like Harvard or Brown, but they're worth something like 18 or 19,000. Uh, so I thought, so let's say it's 20,000 for four years, right? It's $80,000 cash, that kid home. Okay, how many hours a week would you have to practice to top those things, both in sports and things? And I computed it out, and you know what she would have been getting paid per hour? $18. $18 an hour, starting in first grade, which would guarantee you top athlete and top scholar. Just practice, just practice. But who knows that? I'm a, she didn't even know it. And all over the place as kids, throwing away the 18 bucks for five dollars at Burger King, robbing himself for 13 bucks. And, and fathers ignoring their children and, and, and working two jobs to take out some kind of a insurance policy for the kid to go to college when they'd be a lot better off sitting down with the kid and doing the practice and having the kid walk in. Then the kid's not dependent on the father. The father gets run over by a truck, the kid still gets a scholarship. But I didn't realize it's that much. Eighteen dollars an hour for second grade practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it. Though. Yeah, I, guess. I see what you're saying. But why isn't anybody saying that? Why isn't Ross Limbo saying that? Because yeah. he wants he wants to make money and send his kid to college. And he doesn't want your kid beating his kid out. That's why. That's why he doesn't want the blue collar people to galvanize themselves and to, and to realize what's really going on. It's incredible. A guy's got a better chance at a college scholarship with practice than he does at big league basketball. He's got lower odds. You know, if he's out there throwing this thing, but you know, out there all the time, all the time, trying to become a top basketball player, the odds are against him, but not in the intellectual field. There's more opportunity to the intellectual field and less competition. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You can see it right now, the only kids with the only kids that are really practicing are pretty much the Orientals. Even the you know, when I was a kid, the Jewish kids were doing it. The parents were my son, the doctor, I got that. 
the first, first and second generation Jewish kids were really hitting the books. They were greasy grinds, and they were running away with all the high scores. But they're out of it now. <laughs> but the Orientals are really doing it. And the Orientals are blowing the blacks and the Chicanos right off the map because of the practice. That's what it is. It's just, I had this argument with a professor at KU, you know, and he said, oh, no, Arden, it's not that. And then he, he apologized to me. He called me up on the phone and said, I want to make an apology. He said, it happened in my own house. I said, what? My daughter came home from fifth grade. She says, why are the Oriental kids so much smarter? They're not smarter. They're diligent. They're laborious. They're, 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 their parents say, this is work. This is work. This is your work. You are young. You are building your foundation. And we're just TV, you know. Couch with it, just eating potato chips and watching Donatello. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. So, anyway, how do you remember the names of the Ninja Turtles? Do, 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 do you know that? Can you tell them apart for your kids? No, I just heard them zillions of times. What? <laughs> well, that's easy. That's easy. What red? Red, red is Raphael. Red is Raphael, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. right. Oh. That one, that one was real easy. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's blue? Mario. Blue is Leonardo, right? Uh -huh. I don't know that was going to be Halloween. That blue is Leonardo. Mm -hmm. okay. Who are the others? The other two, I thought. Oh, purple. And what? There's, there's purple and what yellow? Orange and, and purple. Orange. Is Michelangelo. J -j 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 the, the orange and the Angelo. Right? Yeah. And the other one is purple for Donatello. Right? So my granddaughter says, Grandpa, Grandpa, how do you how do you know the how do you know the turtle's name? <laughs> Once every six months. Or, <laughs> I said, What do you mean, like 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 that's that's Raphael? Yes. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Same way I know music. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Oh, we are in town. Oh, yeah. Not bad, yeah, I have laughed before. I, you know, I, I can do, I can stay more. I don't know what, what uh, Dr. Jeffrey wanted me to do, but... I'll be, I'll be coming down, I'll be coming back in June if there's anything you want to start or anything, uh, you know, or if you want to have, have any questions or anything. Well, we have, what is it? The what? Learning plain English. Is that it? Would that be a good place to start for us? Where? They have a learning in plain English. That's one of the pieces of teaching. The, the, the reason there isn't hardly anything written, mm -hmm. there's really two reasons. One is, one is that it was changing so fast mm -hmm. that the things that were written would be in competition with, or keeping out, or suppressing newer, better things which had just been discovered by somebody of lower status. Mm -hmm. I was very much against Owen White's message. Mm -hmm. That's how we taught Paris to do it. So the first thing is pinpoint a, a pinpoint a teaching problem I'm having trouble with. Mm -hmm. And the second step is how do I break it down, make it into the time, make it into the practice, how do I work? How do I get more errors and corrects? How do I start with something he's already doing? All, all those rules, you see. And the workbooks don't do that. They sort of kind of, they, they try to be too general, too common. Now, McGreevy's book on how to learn and play in English is the state of the art in probably 70, 76 or 74. Well, God, this is 93. And a lot has happened since then, it's like doubling per week. It should be expected, which I always thought, but nobody else could do it except me until, until Kent Johnson's poured it out routinely from people who were doomed. I mean, these, these, these kids in, in Chicago evidently were given up on by, by everybody. It's just called dumb, and they weren't dumb. They just were poorly taught. We have a, we have a group of kids that are sort of falling in that category now. 
in Alexis's room and Savage's room, um, which I think would be real interesting. But you know, another problem you're going to have is, is is putting some of this in their hands because. Uh, and that's going to be hard to do. And, you know, this how do you get them counting when they can't work? Making a mark, uh, indicating, is a much more primitive behavior than counting. Making a mark right after you did something is a lot easier to do than, than to, well, or you can have push, you can have them push counters like this. We, mm -hmm. All that stuff is sort of going away. Also, cosmetics are involved. For a long time, we had trouble getting. Well, in the 70s, there was a lot of, there still is, a lot of negative reaction towards technology, especially in certain, in places like uh, South, Southwest United States, uh, Navajo Indian Reservation, Oglala Sioux, uh, drunks in Fairbanks, Alaska, who try to put risk counters on them and they throw them away. Is that's the kind of shit that screwed the world up. I don't want to wear that goddamn thing. I only wear a wristwatch. I look at the sun. And, you know, how do you get such a person counting? So, the, the Eric Houghton, who recently died, uh, took rawhide and he put pony beads on it, and two rawhides with the knot on the end with pony beads down, and one's the number correct and the other's the number wrong, and you slide your beads back and forth each day. They they love those. So that's the, co the cosmetics of the counter made the difference with, with those, I don't know what you call them, what, what, what difference between an, an Indian that will count and an Indian that won't count, but uh, an American Indian. But, but they'll count with pony beads, but they won't count. Now, a lot of that stuff goes on in the inner city, a lot of that stuff goes on with Chicanos and Mexicans. And it's, that they will wear a counter that looks like their lifestyle, but they won't wear a counter that looks like something from the man. And all that, all that's involved. It takes us, took us years to discover that. But until we could, there's, there's no way we could give the technology, give the technology to them. And it works in reverse too. I used to go around with the beat counters on, and people say, well, "You got any dope?" You know, I, I, I think it's an advertisement for a grass salesman or something. <laughs> you always smell rope burning. But anyway, so. But it, 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 the main thing, if you want to, you start, and, and then gradually become clearer, and things get going better. And you should put everything you do, you should sort of put on the chart so that you know where, you know how you're doing. And you should try to have the kids looking at the charts. Now, here we're kind of locked in. I mean, the, the charting world is different people. So. Well, we do have in some classrooms, we have the kids charting the charts, but we don't have them looking at the charts. We don't have them looking at them and making judgments and setting aims and all that kind of stuff. No, that's what you yeah. should have. That's what you should have. So they're, they're sort of actively involved in putting the dot in the chart, but they're not actively involved at all in making any decisions no. about what they're doing. So that, that's an important piece for us. That, that's really the whole reason for having them do it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Can we start with one area and then add others? I think that's what we well, you can't, you can't start with anything else. Okay. You only got one foot. Try to start with two One foot, one pair of feet. You have to start someplace. It, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear it's best for everybody to start where they most want to start. Now, that, in, that means teachers. So this teacher may want to start here, and this teacher in the same building won't want to start here. That's okay. No. But you've got to remember, the kids may not even want to start where the teacher does. Now, I, have a, I have an excellent example of that. We, we had one kid that was you know, multiple disordered. I mean, he, he never blew his nose, and he always had a cold, and he had looked like an iridescent tube of green mucus came <laughs> his nose into his mouth. And, and he would he would keep that from dripping onto his clothes by kind of sucking it like spaghetti. And it's pretty gross. Well, anyway, he never buttoned his fly, and he and he wore jockey shorts, and you could kind of sometimes see his penis because they were, they were never. There were always penis was always outside of the jockey shorts, and he never buttoned his fly. 
there was social, we, there was a discussion of the caseworker and the social worker and the teacher and stuff, and, the, and he's, he was about like 15, and they thought he, that was on purpose. That was a form of a flirtation or a sexual advance or the, uh, sexual harassment, as I don't know what. But anyway, he hit other kids. He swore. He was terrible in his, he couldn't do any of his work, right? The teacher's pinpoint would blow his nose. With, here's a handkerchief. Uh, with the teacher's pinpoint was for the teacher to do this. You, see. you know what his, when, the, the thing that he picked to work on first was? Learn how to close what? the zipper. No, close no, zipper. no. Ride a two-wheeler without training wheels. <laughs> so if we really believe this crap, we, we, we got a two-wheeler we, and, and we lift the training wheels and it's something like two weeks. On a chart, we've got him just no, no fall over, so right to him. You know what his second pinpoint was? This is incredible to me. His choice, what was this? Hitting other kids. Really? I'm, I'm, I'm too, too grown up now, now that I'm a two wheel of I, I shouldn't go around beating up on little guys. <laughs> so he got his hitting other kids now in a couple of weeks and then, then blowing his nose. In terms of from his point of view, that makes a lot of sense. But you can see, if you look at from from teachers and other people point of view, nobody's helping him with his problem. His problem isn't is any of this stuff. His problem is that bike out there. It's driving him crazy. But it's kind of interesting. It's almost when when you focus in on a thing like this, it's almost clinically significant. You almost sound like a clinician when you're talking this way about often the, the learner of the technology. But, but it, it isn't traditional behavior analysis to talk this way. It's like some weird combination of client-centered therapy with <laughs> skin or opera conditioning. And yeah, it is. You're right. You're right. Kitchen it's recording. Yeah, and yeah, you're right. There's, there's a little components of everything. There's just a little component. Well, and you know, often, uh, behavior analysis is almost our enemy. They hate it that we have the learners recording their own behavior because they only believe external reliability. They only believe ex when, when some third party has counted. Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out why they did that. Now I finally figured out, I think, why, why they have reliability studies. Why? To support graduate students on research funds. <laughs> So wonder, so wonder they didn't discover six instead of two. Mm -hmm. There's six people watching one kid learn, all making a mark. <laughs> they, could, they could support a lot of graduate students. It's right. not training money. You see, tra training money, yeah. training money dried up. But they, 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 got, they got graduate students sitting around looking in window, making marks on what kids are doing. Oh no, that's right. That's what you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And which graduate student are you supporting? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. All right, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you again, Bob Warshin, for providing these and getting approval. If you're into this channel, make sure you subscribe down here. And over here is more videos that you may be interested. Thank you again. That's your Daily B.A.